Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Milger, and I will be your gaming, mo your dungeon master, for the evening. Because for this, I'd like to address you as the GM of RV Tabletop. While the campaigns within the RVT crew have been on their Twitch channel, with this new campaign after a short holiday, the adventures are moving to the most unholy of temples, namely mine. In my tenure as GM, we've run several different unorthodox games: the Kitbash of Ryder, the weirdness of Numenera. The Perilous Intrigue of Warhammer, and the thing that was Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Throughout it all, I've had a central theme of running games outside the norm, outside the expected. That was the goal I had when I agreed to be the GM in the first place. I never want to be the GM who's just following popular trends based on creators or games. This tradition will continue with our next grand campaign, Zeitgeist, The Gears of Revolution. As the name might imply, Zeitgeist is a steampunk adventure. However, its stylings are more akin to the Renaissance and Enlightenment eras of history than the over-the-top uses of clockwork. That's not to say there isn't a shortage of crazy stuff in this setting, but it's grounded in the breadth of philosophical debates and conflicts between old and new traditions. Some of the races will be familiar to veterans of D&D, but they have their own spins on how they work within the region's five great nations. The player characters in this tale will be members of one of those nations, Risur, Specifically, it's Royal Homeland Constabulary Organization, a mixture between police and secret service. The RHC's duty is to protect the nation from threats without and within. For those of you with an anime background, the RHC is not far removed from Public Security Section 9 in Ghost in the Shell. Mechanics-wise, we'll be using the controversial Dungeons & Dragons 4th Edition. This is partially because of my own policies, but also because I feel this is the best system to utilize the development that the story has in its run. We'll start by looking at the nations of this setting. Risur, the subtropic nation of druids, is known as the place that lulled the great spirits known as Fey Titans, which had terrorized human nations for centuries before that. The country's wilderness has a great deal of forest and field in its environment, along with some swamps due to the region's rainy seasons. This mostly fertile landscape makes fruits and fish count as among their biggest exports, but meat is harder to come by, especially in the more industrialized cities. The weather in Risur tends to be fairly consistent, with the exception of a rainy season near the end of the summer. While the capital of Risur is Slate, its most important city to its current industrialization is Flint. With a population of at least half a million, Flint is the centerpiece of industries and factories for the nations, with many foreign emissaries heading to the city to curry favor. Risur tends to lean towards pantheism in its religion, with the most public respect given to the stargazing druids known as Skyseers. These individuals would read patterns in the night sky to offer guidance and prophecy to lords and peasantry alike. While they don't hold as much political power as they once did due to moves toward industry and the emergence of other faiths, they are still highly regarded. Risur is also a constitutional monarchy, with his current ruler being King Audhan. A veteran of the Third Eurosol War, Audhan has a fascination with steam-based technology, making him instrumental in the rising industries in Flint. Below him are 23 governors that direct their various provinces, most of which follow lines of nobility, unlike the crown itself. Many of these governors have their own sub-bureaucracies to handle specific topics like culture, defense, and commerce. A debate has sparked between two schools of thought on research technological development, between adopting the steam-based technology pioneered on Denor, or the traditional arcane technologies, with the latter slowly losing ground. But to counter the influx of foreign agents alongside this foreign technology, King Audhan established the Royal Homeland Constabulary, or RHC, which we'll delve into later. Research's main rivals have always been the southern kingdom of Bear whose former dragon tyrants had assaulted their borders many times, as well as the technologically inclined Danor. The latter nation they've had four wars with over the Eurasol archipelago for over 200 years, losing much ground in the process due to Danor's advanced tech. Currently, the two of them are in a more stable foundation, but it's unknown if hostilities will resume. The Kingdom of Bear is an unusual nation compared to the others as it's composed primarily of what might be considered monster races. For centuries, Bear was ruled by the dragons that battled each other for supremacy alongside other tribes, making the land one of constant flux. With the death of the last dragon king, Bear had splintered into a series of racial and tribal factions, only having some semblance of unity about 40 years ago. This makes Bear a young nation, all things considered, undergoing a great deal of cultural reform. 
This reform began when an orc named Vanderlei Bruce conquered three of the largest cities, but instead of invading, he opened up channels with Danor, asking for help in writing a constitution and the construction of factories. The latter was a means to keep warlords cooperative while keeping the fighting to a minimum. This also led to attempts to end Bear's slave trade, the creation of the Executores de la Liberta, to enforce these changes. Upon his death, he took a page from Resor and passed his rulership onto a chosen successor instead of a blood relative. In this case, a respected minotaur and colleague, who is dubbed Bruce Santos. While the dragons mostly exist as bone trophies within the cities, their mark can still be felt in some ways. The major cities are built with massive perches. Berens have romantic concepts of flight. Celebrations infrequently happen on rooftops, and window cleaners swing on multicolored ropes. But the biggest contribution is the megafauna. Herds of incredibly massive elephants, cattle, and even tigers, the smallest of which might be considered the size of a house, whose destructive presence make large amounts of bear's territory uninhabitable for lengthy amounts of time. These creatures are domesticated in some places, and a single one of these beasts can feed a whole village for days on end. Even with this reform, there are two emergent factions that may decide the young nation's future. In the south, a series of tribes composed mostly of gnolls have refused to join bear, believing that their slain dragon Gradiax will make his return. On the other side of this equation, a youth movement called the Panoply has emerged in Bear. Inspired by the cooperation among its races, they've made strides to fund schools of art and culture. Some of these professors have made their presence known in other regions, inviting foreigners to attend banquets of Bear and nobles, looking to appear cultured. While Bear's tribal nature has kept it relatively isolated from the affairs of other nations, its main concern is Cresilier, due to their relationship with Danor. In their mind, it would not take much for the theocratic nation to establish a guilt-by-association attitude towards them, especially since the church views Danor as heretical. A millennium ago, the nation that is now known as Cresilier was ruled by demons. Now it's ruled by its clergy, turning the nation into a beacon of enlightenment and arcane research. While the clergy's power is supreme, it is not unquestioned. Arcanists debate concepts that differ from dogma. Merchants pay lip service to the faith while supplying weapons to Eldrin assassins, and even though the Genem Credetos, or God Hands, guard the nation from spiritual influence, criminal organizations can still bring in contraband. Even the dead are not safe, being resurrected to be extorted. Cresilier's holy text preaches that humanity has a spark of divinity within them, allowing them to become a god by constantly challenging oneself. While they believe in many gods, minus a godhead at the center, this belief in potential is at the forefront of their faith. On the other hand, they only see the superior potential in humans, and no other race. It's no surprise, then, that Cresilier holds up large colonies within the former Eledrin Empire, including the ruins of that empire's capital. Despite the colonies providing great wealth, they are frequently the target of rebellions and acts of terrorism with assassinations happening at least once every few years. The ironic part of their faith is that some humans who are present at the death of the Elder and Goddess have gained a sliver of her divine spark, continually reincarnating for the past 500 years as devas. Despite the front displayed by the faithful, the clergy has a darker underbelly in its lands, the family. Considered an open secret at best and hearsay at worst, they are the largest organized crime group in the Avery Sea. While the clergy would claim Danor is a nation of heretics with demon faces, in truth, Danor is a nation of progress. Centuries ago, they were hit the hardest by the great malice that affected the world, the region becoming a literal dead zone for magic. Without arcane or divine aid, they were effectively cut off. Thousands of priests died in despair, believing their gods had abandoned them. Making it worse was the transformation of its clergymen into demonic appearances as well as the wild magic that spawned monstrosities the land's defenders were powerless to stop. All that changed when a man named Jier brought a proposal. If the hands of the gods could not reach them, then it would be the hands of mortals that would give them power. After all, it was the old ways, the old faiths, the old traditions that had held them back and brought suffering. Instead, they would embrace progress as the path to their future. While the change took centuries to enact, it eventually did take hold in their new society. Even then, Jier would refuse the title of king, 
merely being part of a congress of peers. Despite Danor being a constitutional republic, Jair's descendants are a royal family in all but name. A new sovereign is voted into office every ten years, and it's been the Jair who have held that position so far every time. Currently, Danor sits at the forefront of developments in science and technology. Obviously, the majority of Tiflings in the region come from Danor. Their appearance is the result of an ancient curse from the death of the Eldoran goddess. The Federated Drakhan States, or just Drakkar, was formed of a fractured group of dwarven clans and human provinces that united in mutual defense in the wake of the Great Malice, as fighting each other became less appealing in the face of malice-born abominations. Drak's regional governors manage farming and trade while its dwarven lords direct mining operations, as well as the nation's military. Thanks in part to their alliances with Danor, they've taken to utilizing steam technology to their own advantages. In particular, they have built and seen to the defense of the Avery Coast Railroad, powered by arcane furnaces. In addition, the best firearms in the world come from Drak. Despite overthrowing the clergy some time ago, one aspect that survived was schools of philosophy. Every region would have their own brand of philosophers who would spread their ideas to leaders and businessmen. One of the most well-known of these philosophies is Hyde Eschathal, the focus on proper endings. This philosophy has given rise to a nihilistic attitude among some, since they believe the world is doomed to a frigid death from ancient glacier-bound horrors. Long ago, the kings of Elphivar could rival all the other nations. The Eldrin monarchs could command legions of slaves and battalions of fey. Now, only ruins survive. When the elven goddess Srasma was killed during the second victory, it would create a chain reaction that would cause the great malice and much worse things. As she was the embodiment of the maiden, mother, and crone concept to the Eldrin, this killed the majority of Eldrin women in the Empire and beyond. It didn't take long for the remaining parts of the kingdom to descend into chaos, a once massive nation reduced to mere slivers. While many sought revenge, it was the intervention of the poet Vakesh that introduced a new philosophy, to live, to endure, and to free Eldrin women from control, as what few women survived became valuable property to suitors. In the centuries after the Great Malice, Jungle had overtaken many of the Elphivar cities. Magical effects began to bleed out in disrepair, and in some places, the material world had blended with the Fey Dreaming. It's in these blended borderlands that several pockets of Eldrin matriarchs and their enclaves survive. That covers the nations. But let's take a moment to look at the city that will be our focal point in this tale, Flint. While Flint is not the capital of Resor, it is nevertheless an important city. With a population of approximately 800,000, it's the standard bearer for Resor's industrial revolution. Flint has nine districts, each presided by an elected district mayor. First is Bolsom Strand, which is presided by Griffin Stowe. The eastern docks that line this district are the heart of the city's trade, both legal and less so. Bolsom is mostly a docker district and thus it's full of warehouses, bars, taverns, and merchants. Despite the mayor insisting on making the underbelly unseen, all it's done is embolden performers to ply their craft on as many street corners as possible. Currently, the district is clearing tenants and building for the construction of a freight line. This has been a slow process, as local druids have been recruited to speak with and appease the spirits of the land. The central district is presided by Onkala Puntem, it's the oldest district in Flint and is home to its main structures, including the city council, court, and police HQ. Despite many parts of Central providing entertainment to the nobility and middle class, the Orange Street Market and Pardright University are the centerpieces of the city's economic and academic culture. Central's mayor recently approved the building of a subrail station to act as the hub of a transportation network, meant to alleviate the traffic from the surface rail system. This has been dogged by elements opposed to resource industrialization. Most importantly, Central District is home to the local headquarters of the RHC, headed by Lady Inspectress Margaret Saxby. Cloudwood covers Flint's eastern outskirts, which features a lot of cloud-covered mountains, highlands, and rainforest, hence its name. Its population is sparse compared to the other districts, but given how it's believed to be closer to the Fey Dreaming than other places as well. 
Its new mayor, Doyle Dills, has a love-hate relationship with the district's superstitions. A bigger thorn in his side is the Eldarin woman known as Gale, who has led multiple actions against Flint's industrial efforts. For most of Flint's history, the Nettles were home to druidic rituals and romantics who wished to enjoy the view. However, one part of it became known as Cauldron Hill when it was taken over by a coven of witches. While the coven was defeated, Cauldron Hill is still haunted by spirits for the past century, being blocked off to keep the foolhardy from ascending the hill and coming back possessed. In recent years, the Nettles has had an upswing of slum housing, with more and more people looking to find work in Flint's factories. Opposite that is the North Shore, a place that is very proud of its appearance, despite being close to the polluted Parity Lake. Having some of the best urban beaches in the region, its beauty is only matched by the corrupt underbelly of the noble-filled district. Unsurprisingly, the Denoran Consulate is located here. Their mayor, Aaron Quire, has petitioned for a wall between North Shore and Parity Lake to keep the undesirables out. As for Parity Lake, it's a consequence of the early days of this industrialization. Going into overdrive during the Fourth Eurosol War, its many factories turned it into a crowded war and surrounding a lake that resembles sludge more than water. The district's police force maintains a heavy-handed measure to maintain order, and its mayor has stated that the stability of the factories takes precedence. Parity Lake has been subject to fires on occasion, which are suspected to be arson, since they target local industrialists. More feared, however, is a serial killer that wanders the area known as the Ragman, and even worse is the recently shacking up gang boss Lorcan Kell. Next is Pine Island, which takes its name from the pine trees along the bits of dry lands of its bayous, alongside grassy ranch land. Pine Island can be considered the biggest farmland area of Flint. It also houses the Battalion Academy, which trains elite soldiers and martial scientists, emphasizing wilderness survival as many of its professors are veterans of the Yerosol Wars. Stray River, on the other hand, is the closest thing to a Rasuri city anywhere near Flint. A far more quaint appearance than the other districts, Stray River has many of the oldest mills in Resor. Lastly, the Ares, which is a chain of satellite islands to the north of the city. The habitable islands serve as remote villas for the wealthiest members of it, and while the Ares is technically part of the North Shore, its government officials rarely bother the nobles unless another noble lodges a complaint. Finally, let's look at the organization that our heroes will be a part of, the Royal Homeland Constabulary. As mentioned before, this was established by King Audhan in the wake of foreign cooperation. The constables of the RHC are tasked with protecting Reeser's interests from foreign plots, magical criminals, and supernatural foes. Because the RHC is viewed to act with the king's authority, they are granted a significant amount of leeway in their investigations. While this doesn't mean they have to acquire warrants as often as normal police, this is an understanding based on trust, that the constables will not abuse their authority. As a result, they do have to fill out elaborate paperwork and testimony justifying their activities, as abusing this power can result in penalties, demotions, or even prison time. Execution is also discouraged, as constables are expected to take suspects alive. Regardless of rank, a constable will have access to binding rope as well as handcuffs. These are usually made with some sort of gold lining, as gold blocks teleportation magic. In special circumstances, constables can requisition mage cuffs, which can shock their subject if they attempt to cast spells. Typically, they'll hand subjects to the police, but the RHC's headquarters does have special cells for special subjects. Among the RHC's recruiting pool are police, military, and several universities. Even foreign applicants aren't outside the realm of possibility. Potential recruits will endure extensive background checks, alongside a magical inquisition. This involves opening their minds so that the branch's local director can sense their actual intentions. While the RHC is run by Margaret Saxby in Flint, its directorial role has her dealing with bureaucrats, leaving the day-to-day -day operations to Stolver Delft, her assistant chief inspector, who oversees four units of constables, one of which being the party. Because of the nature of the RHC's duties, they often have to deal with threats at sea as well as threats locally. While they don't command a full fleet, they do have five ships at their disposal in Flint. These are the Audacious, a cutter that is the closest thing to a flagship of the Flint branch, the Inevitable, a steam cutter that is relatively new to the RHC, only being in service for five years, the Rose Common, a schooner with fey designs 
that enable short-range teleporting. A dwarven steamship called the Urundun that was captured during the Fourth Eurosol War, and the Impossible, a clipper that's built for speed and urgency. That about covers everything in this brief look at the world our next story will inhabit, so I hope to see you all there when we begin. Stay frosty!